my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet and made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. Discover why moms are reporting more milk in less time with the Luna Breast Pump and see how you can get it covered through insurance at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. At the end of this episode, I'll have more information about the Luna Breast Pump from Motif Medical. The Birth Hour's Know Your Options Childbirth course is still available. You can find that at thebirthhour.com slash course. And you can use the coupon code 100 off for $100 off your purchase of that course. You get lifetime access and it's immediate access. If for some reason you don't get the email right away to log in, just look in your spam folder. I've had a few people message me about that recently. Um, or you can always message me for support as well. Today's guest is Amanda, and she's going to share two birth stories, as well as her journey with breastfeeding and how her struggles with breastfeeding really led to her founding Nest Collaborative, which has been brought up on this podcast before, so I was excited to connect with Amanda and hear more about that as well. All right, let's get to Amanda's story. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here with you. Great. Well, can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, absolutely. I live in Connecticut with my husband, Ryan, and our two children. Uh, We have Josie, who is hard to believe eight and a half now, and Harold, my son, who's five and a half. And we moved to Connecticut, feels like recently, but just uh, in the last couple of years to be closer to family. So it's been it's been nice. We really like it here. Great. Well, I know we're going to focus on your more recent birth today. So let's start by talking about um, your pregnancy with Harold. Yeah. So uh, Harold was my second pregnancy. And I feel fortunate that kind of what I thought would be good spacing for our family uh, worked out. And so I went through the pregnancy with no real early complications. Um, I always am one to be nauseous during the first trimester. So somehow made it through (laughs) that. And, you know, just generally excited. You know, Josie was a toddler at that point, and I was really excited for her to have a sibling. And she was just old enough, almost three, to understand a little bit of what was happening. And our family was in Maryland at the time, and I was due near all of our birthdays. My my family oddly has all of our birthdays. We're all Aquarians. <laughs> and of course, I was due around that time. So it was just an exciting time. I got to celebrate my husband's birthday and then uh, mine and my dad's and, and Josie's. And then we had another one. So, um, so yeah, the pregnancy was relatively going smoothly um, until around 36 weeks. I was lying in bed and really felt the baby flip and thought, I'm fairly certain of what I just felt and called my OB and, and went in and, and told her this. And of course, I think she was like, mm-hmm, sure, and, you know, <laughs> um, but sent me for an ultrasound. And uh, indeed, he had flipped. <laughs> so now for the first time, I was looking at a breech baby, which I I hadn't experienced before. And so we kind of had to do some planning around that. And also at the time we, we had a major blizzard. So what I do remember very well was having two to three feet of snow and thinking, what on earth would we do (laughs) if I went into labor and we couldn't get out and I had this breech baby. Uh, But fortunately, we had a retired OB who lived across the street, so I had a temporary place. (laughs) That's convenient. Um, Yes, I'm not sure he would have loved the knock on the door. (laughs) But so we talked with my OB about options, and, you know, she gave us the option of doing a a version procedure. 
So we went ahead uh, and opted to try the version, even though we knew that statistically most were not successful. So that was interesting in itself. At our hospital nearby, they do this as a as an official procedure. So we went into the procedure room and, and my husband, who is a physician, uh, was with me and proceeded to actually watch my OB successfully turn this baby. And I just remember him saying that it was the wildest thing he's seen because you could actually kind of visualize the parts of the baby. And so much to our surprise, the procedure was successful and he was head down after. Um, and I think this was around 38 weeks. So that kind of felt like a little bit of the pressure was off. And so we went back to waiting. You know, we didn't, with both our children, we didn't find out what the sex was going to be. So we were eagerly anticipating baby's arrival. And differently than my first, where I was uh, induced, uh, I actually went into labor naturally. My water broke in the middle of the night. And (laughs) second child, I just put a towel down and went back to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) No contractions or anything yet. (laughs) <laughs> no. Um, and I mean, I must have been really tired to do that. Uh, I'm I'm a nurse, so, you know, I probably knew better. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, about an hour later, you know, buzzed my OB and, and she said, come in. Um, so this was about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning um, and it was starting to snow, which is special because, it, again, we're all born at the same time. And I know that I, my mom has shared with me that I was born in a snowstorm. And so it was nice. Um or as nice as labor can be, um, I did opt again for uh, an epidural, and shortly thereafter, you know, did start to dilate, much more uh, a quicker progression certainly than, than my first, uh, which I was hoping for. And um, as I was approaching, I guess eight centimeters, we start to notice that the baby was desatting, which. Uh, it means that, you know, his uh, or her heartbeat is decreasing with contractions, uh, which my husband and I knew was of concern. And when the pattern kind of continued, I think I automatically knew that this was likely to go into a, a cesarean situation and and was preparing. So my OB, who's wonderful, came in and she said, OK, let's push. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> And I thought, well, I said, what, you know, I thought it was just eight centimeters. And she said, yes, you are. Let's push. And um, I was nervous, Mm -hmm. but I think I'm a little stoic when I get nervous. And (laughs) I'll just remember the TV was on and it was the Real Housewives of the Potomac, which is not necessarily a show I I would watch. But my husband said, do you want me to turn that off? And I said, no. I need to, I need to focus on something else other than feeling worried. <laughs> but lo and behold, this OB got this baby out and sure enough, you know, his cord was was around his his neck which which looking back is a risk of uh the version procedure I believe. Mm-hmm. And um but fortunately, um she got him out. Uh we got the the cord unraveled um and he wailed and got his color and was fine, which was much a relief. And he was a boy, uh, which we were thrilled about. Um, so it seemed as if all was good in the world. <laughs> I went to rest and, you know, he was born at 5.30 in the morning. So this was probably seven-ish. And the lights were dim. Uh, and I noticed someone came into the room and quietly kind of peeped over to, to my chart to make some notes. And I looked and it was the anesthesiologist And I thought to myself, kind of knowing how the hospital works, well, the anesthesiologist typically does not show his face after the epidural. What's up? And I recognized him at the time because we had a mutual friend in common. Kind of going back to my husband's birthday, which was just a few weeks prior, I had taken him to a Bruce Springsteen concert and we were in like the nosebleeds. And so here I am, you know, 38 weeks pregnant and we're climbing to the top of this venue and everyone around me was just worried that I was going to topple down with my huge stomach. And lo and behold, there was an anesthesiologist in front of us. Um, So we had gotten to talking and it turned out that, you know, our mutual, you know, common ground was this particular anesthesiologist. So I went on to recover and 
and started to feel a little strange. Uh, I'd say that afternoon or evening and strange, I mean, kind of in my back area, kind of between my shoulder blades specifically started to feel as if I was a marionette, kind of that there was this pulling. And so I was sharing this with my husband and sharing it with the nurses and ultimately asked to see my OB and asked if there could be any concern. Um, I forget what the condition is, but it's essentially when the epidural doesn't exactly go. The epidural's a little overshot, I think is the best way to explain it. Um, And so you get a little bit of a puncture that's not expected. And what the result is, is typically the symptomology is a dural headache is how they explain it. And so my OB came in and said, well, typically you'd see or you'd hear about kind of an ice pick style headache. And she said, I actually had it. Um, So what you're describing is not too concerning. And I proceeded to go overnight kind of with it getting worse. And by the next day, uh, could barely move. I remember putting the movable bed back all the way and I had the baby with me. Um, and when I went to try to turn to get me up, I, I couldn't get up. Um, it, it almost felt like a paralysis and, and I panicked, um, one, cause I had the baby with me and two, because it was terrifying. Yeah. And I don't panic easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like that nightmare people get where they can't move. Yeah. And and that's when I kind of put my foot down and said something is wrong. Yeah. And so the team came and, and they decided to to go ahead and treat me uh, for this condition, which is really to take you back into the procedure room. And they actually, and the irony as an ER nurse, I was an ER nurse um, in the ER for eight years. So I actually performed this procedure from the opposite side. Um, and the procedure is to to put an IV in and actually draw blood from the arm. Sorry if this is getting too gory. Nope, not on this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then they go back in with another epidural and they actually push that blood um, into the space and it it clots. Mm. It's called a blood patch. And so it fixes the problem. Mm -hmm. And so they went ahead and did that and... um, and then I, you know, probably woke up a few hours later and was 100% better. Wow. Very odd. And I think an interesting thing that happens and, you know, not that you want to scare anyone going into pregnancy or, or into labor, but it does happen. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a, something that people should be aware of only because of the need to really advocate for yourself. Right. So, you know, everything from there on out in terms of the delivery was fine. We took Harold home. After Josie came to visit him, and it was great. We we went home with our family of four, um, which is great. Well, thanks for sharing about that experience. Yeah, I think that especially for a first time parent, you just don't know like, is this normal? Should I be feeling this way? And so, I think it's like you said, it's really important to just know about these things so that you can be like, hey, this doesn't feel right. Let's look into it a little bit more. Yeah, and and even going back to to deciding to do the version, um, I don't think we would have chosen differently. Um, but again, knowing just the risks and benefits of, mm-hmm. of all the decisions you're making, you know, I think I knew that, that this was a risk in terms of mm-hmm. the cord coming around his neck. If you think kind of physiologically, when you're turning a baby, you know, with your hands, right. <laughs> uh, you don't know really where that cord is and, and they try to visualize it. And, and there's, there are a number of things that they do ahead of time to make sure that, you know, there's no issues that would complicate it even more. Um, but, you know, just something to always be aware of. All right. So then how was your postpartum experience once you got home? I know you probably have some things to share about breastfeeding as well, given what you do (laughs) for a living. (laughs) Yes. So much like my experience with Josie, initiating breastfeeding was difficult again, which really was annoying, I think, because I had gone through it and I felt like I had not only persevered with Josie a little bit, but had really educated myself or so I thought. (laughs) Um, But here I was again, uh, really struggling to latch him. You know, there were times that I was sitting on the couch. I specifically remember this being in our family room, I was on the couch and my parents were, were with us and I, it probably took an hour just to get him latched. And my mother, who didn't breastfeed, you know, I was born in 1979 when, you know, formula was the greatest thing. And my mom said, geez, how many days do you have to do this? <laughs> and I thought, 
mom, it's not just days. But looking back, I mean, she just was looking at me being tortured. Um, But again, I didn't reach out for help. I knew better um, having been through this before, but it was quite a struggle. And I just kind of dealt with the issues like I did much the first time, which I had plenty of issues then. But even with Harold, you know, I ended up with yeast mastitis again. And it's a mess trying to figure out what to do and how to get rid of it. And not knowing most importantly, what I know now is identifying the cause of these issues, whether it's clog ducts or crack nipples or popping off the latch or, you know, recurrent uh, mastitis or much less one mastitis. Um, It's really all about getting to the root cause, not just fixing the issue. And I wish I knew that then. But yeah, eventually we got it together, but I only could really get him to latch strongly off of one side, which ended up in, you know, depleting my milk supply on the other side. But ironically, I ended up breastfeeding him for a very long time. Uh, I think we stopped at age three from one breast (laughs) the whole time. Oh, wow. I have a friend who did that as well. And it's it's kind of amazing. Well, I mean, it was, you know, became kind of funny because especially during the summertime, you know, I was a little lopsided. Yeah. (laughs) But this was the first time I I felt successful and I I really, I was so proud and he loved it. You know, Um, I don't know if it is true, you know, little boys, they certainly are, you know, he, he was into it uh, Mm -hmm. and didn't show any signs of, of wanting to wean. And like I said, I I just felt really proud that, that I was able to, so it really didn't bother me. But again, never occurred to me to reach out for help to prevent that um, or re- try to reestablish the supply on the on the left side. Um, but it worked, fortunately. Yeah. You know, he grew and <laughs> had no growth issues. But, you know, what this experience did, and, and I'm sure you do know, but it really made me look into the issues surrounding breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. And was I the only one who struggled? Um, So I really started to delve into some research uh, all about breastfeeding in the U.S. And um, it ended up becoming a bit of a passion. (laughs) Yeah. Let's hear about that too. So I think it was around 11 months when Harold was about 11 months because it was the time when he had had a solid nap schedule. And I, (laughs) someone was giving away an exercise machine. And so I took it and said, okay, this this morning nap period is when I'm going to exercise. And I think it was on day two of this plan when I had kind of these ideas and these thoughts. And I don't think I got back on that thing again. Um, So I essentially started looking into how we could utilize technology to give families better access in general to healthcare. Now, I eventually left the ER and uh, became a pediatric nurse practitioner. So I was kind of looking at this through the lens of all pediatric care from breastfeeding on and started to look into this you know, new, little known thing called, at the time, telemedicine. Now, I've always been a little bit of a tech nerd. So this was natural for me to explore the technology side, but really honing in. And the good thing about breastfeeding is at the time and still now that so much research has already been done. So we knew the benefits of breastfeeding and even more so the research had been done on how many women were successful with it and how many women weren't. The ratio was not good. And the Surgeon General had already put out, you know, a call to action in 2011, uh, really calling, you know, um, healthcare leaders and government leaders to really try to improve breastfeeding rates across the U.S. because of the potential impact on the health of both women and infants. And then, you know, you of course got to look at the business side of everything and the potential cost decrease of both of these generations um, for all stakeholders, you you know, whether that's OBs or pediatricians or healthcare, hospital administrators, uh, Medicaid's, private commercial payers. So I began to see the size of the problem and what the potential impact could be on fixing some pretty simple issues, I thought. The first of which was access. There's a shortage essentially of, you know, lactation consultants, board certified lactation consultants. And therefore it was impossible for every woman giving birth, which is about 4 million every year, it was impossible to get lactation consultants to give care to them. And so the telehealth piece to me seemed vital. And the other issue with successful breastfeeding seemed to point to cost. Um, Even if you could find a lactation consultant uh, to come to your home, which was pretty much the standard at that time, it was quite costly. Uh, It wasn't covered by insurance. 
And the other piece was really on education. You know, most most women kind of going in for a number of reasons to breastfeeding, um, not really knowing much about it. Um, and a lot of that was relates to social changes over the last few decades. You know, we're just not around family with six siblings watching our aunts and cousins and moms breastfeeding. Um, and we're having babies later and we're more separated from our families to get the, you know, kind of support and guidance from them. So I was kind of fiddling through this and, and then came upon something, a, a big piece of, of reading called the Affordable Care Act and found kind of in the depths of it that breastfeeding support was actually supposed to be fully covered as a mandate. Um, and that, that mandate dated back to 2012. And this was now, you know, almost 2017 or it was 2017. And I thought to myself, they're not paying for this they're supposed to. And that's when I kind of went very headstrong (laughs) and said, well, we're going to make them. Yeah. And that was it. Uh, You know, I don't know what lit my fire, um, but that was it. So here we are now in 2021. um, And while I, you know, worked really hard for for a few years to kind of get this concept up and running, um, who knew it would take a global pandemic uh, to really kind of educate the world on the value of telehealth. And right. now I'm, you know, really excited that that over the last year, uh, we have serviced thousands of families with lactation support via virtual care. Um, we've got a great, excellent team of amazing lactation consultants. I mean, what they do and how they are able to connect with families who really need them and these are, you know, these consults are stressful, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and they really, they really have worked some magic and proven that, you know, virtual care can be very effective. And so, yeah, I'm thrilled. Our company, our group is is called Nest Collaborative, and we do virtual consults nationwide, uh, prenatal education, uh, early postpartum, mid postpartum, late postpartum, everything from from learning about breastfeeding to to weaning. Uh, whenever mom is ready, you know, we really support families with, you know, making their own informed choices. And, and our job is just to help them, you know, carry out those choices and goals. And we do this under reimbursement from an insurance, which was, was really, you know, a huge solid requirement right. for me personally, um, just to, you know, reduce the barriers and, and help more people feed their babies the way they want to. Yeah, I actually heard about you guys through one of our other podcast guests. They listed it as a resource and I was like, this sounds too good to be true. (laughs) But yeah, and I think that, you know, we have virtual doulas now and all these things that, like you said, came from the pandemic. And I think it's just so nice to make it more accessible, especially like when you look at your website for booking, there's a time available anytime, basically. Yeah. (laughs) Day or night, seven days a week. I mean, I remember with my first just not having anyone to help me. And I had gone to a La Leche League meeting while I was pregnant and I called one of those leaders and she, you know, had little ones of her own. This was just something she did, you know, as a volunteer on the side. And she's like, yeah, I could maybe come like on Saturday. And it was like Wednesday, you know, and I was like, that's not gonna do it, you know, and I just burst into tears. And um, so something like this would have been such a lifesaver. Yes. And, and that gap, you know, in time, you know, the chips fall quickly when there's pain, when there's anxiety, when there's a screaming hungry baby. And, you know, I've had to explain that so many times over, you know, because one thing I didn't have, I had the experience on the healthcare side and the experience as personally as a mom who struggled to breastfeed, but I didn't necessarily have an MBA going into this. So, um, you know, having to really kind of pitch this to other stakeholders who didn't necessarily know the problem, you know, I had to explain how essential immediate care is right um that waiting those few days is that's when people stop breastfeeding yeah exactly so yes and and we realized babies don't work on banking hours um and (laughs) we really needed that access yeah but it's been great i mean i feel so grateful honestly to be able to have have helped these women i think you know reading the notes uh, of these visits and reading the feedback we've gotten from families you know there's so much uh, you know emotions there's the mental health piece um, there's the anxiety, there's the lack of confidence, the lack of empowerment. And, you know, we don't have a whole lot of prenatal education coming to these families. Um, so just being able to help them 
get more prepared and build their support system even before baby comes and just even, you know, teaching people that uh, why that's necessary. It's, I don't know, I, I, I feel very lucky to be able to help and feel like we are actually making a difference. Yeah. I think the unexpected benefit was, you know, having, you know, the opportunity now to really be building out partnerships with healthcare systems uh, who also recognize why this is so important. And I, that's recent, you know, the focus on, maternal health, uh, infant mortality, maternal mortality. Um, thank goodness, you know, everyone's kind of waking up to that Mm -hmm. because that's the real significant impact here. So yeah, it's exciting things happening and hopefully more, more in the pipeline here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about that. Are there any other resources that you want to share with our listeners here at the end? I think education is key wherever you get it. You know, obviously, you know, clinical resources, ideally that are clinically relevant, well researched, whether that's your healthcare providers or, you know, there are well vetted online resources. So I don't want to say never go online, but I think there are are better resources online than not. But just getting really well informed. You know, as we know, Kelly Mom is a is a really reputable online site with with great information. Mm-hmm. I hesitate to talk too much with friends and family because everyone's experience is different and we don't want anyone jaded or biased. You know, I felt my experience is that I wanted to warn all my friends of how difficult it was. But I realized after a while that 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 isn't my place because it didn't necessarily mean their experience was going to be terrible. Uh, nor did it mean that they were going to try to breastfeed after I told them that. (laughs) You know, I think educating yourself with whatever resources are around, but certainly building your support system ahead of time, whether that's your partner, uh, knowing who in your family and neighborhood will be supportive of breastfeeding because not all, you know, of your best friends and family necessarily will be, depending on their own experience. Seeking out what lactation resources are around you, whether that's La Leche League uh, or independent bre- uh, lactation consultants. Uh, know the resources if you're birthing outside your home, you know, what that they have at birthing centers or hospitals. And certainly reach out for, for virtual help uh, because it's definitely becoming more and more mainstream. And we have proven it is actually extremely beneficial. And also know your your health plan. I say rights, but you know health plans are required to provide things like breast pumps and breastfeeding support. So kind of know ahead of time how to make it easier on yourself in getting that paid. But of course, we help with that in S Collaborative too. <laughs> Great. Where's the best place for people to reach out to you and then also to find S Collaborative resources? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, certainly, you know, Nest Collaborative is pretty easy to access either uh, at our website, nestcollaborative.com. We always have a, a chatbot uh, receiving any inquiries online. Info at Nest Collaborative. Uh, we take any questions. We're on Instagram and Facebook at Nest Collaborative. And you can certainly always reach out to me directly on any of those resources. I'm very actively involved in the company and uh, we've got a great marketing and social media manager that makes sure that I get all my messages. So either of those, you can reach me. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. It was really great chatting with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Now I'm going to chat with Ashley about Motif Medical's Luna Breast Pump. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Motif Medical and their breast pumps. Thanks for having me, Bryn. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about you and your background? So my background is actually in nutrition, and I worked for WIC as a nutrition educator for a while and then um, became an IBCLC in about 2017. Um, I started my own business uh, at that time, probably just prior to getting my certification, just doing breastfeeding classes and and, um, support groups, things like that. I had my own little girl in 2015 and and breastfed her for almost three years, so... um, I have I have different perspectives kind of coming in from all angles and backgrounds when it comes to breastfeeding and 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 support needed and and that that sort of thing. Um, when I revamped and and kind of got a little bit more tech savvy with um, 
you know, better promoting my, my own personal business, I was able to come in contact with um, Motif Medical. And they reached out wanting someone that kind of sees eye to eye with them as far as um, similar goals and um, similar outreach. And their approach is very similar to what I try to do. And that's um, trying to make breastfeeding feel more like something anybody can accomplish. You know, you don't have to be super granola or <laughs> uh, anything like that to, to want to breastfeed and breastfeed as long as you want um, or pump exclusively or, you know, anything like that. You know, they try to meet the mom where they're at and kind of give it more of a modern approach, which I that really, really speaks to me. So I've been working with them for a little over a year and a half now as their lactation director. And a lot of their uh, blogs and information um, that's more medically geared or a little bit more um, in depth with lactation is written by yours truly. So it's it's a great collaboration and it's it's been an awesome journey working alongside them. It's a great team. Very cool. Yeah, I love all the content they're putting out to help educate as well. And so it's cool to know that you're behind that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they always um, they always collaborate and come up with uh, topics that are relevant. And a lot of it is generated by questions from consumers and and people looking um, to get a better pump and that sort of thing. So it's it's questions coming from the source. So I know that you know by answering those things, you know I'm I'm answering things that are important to people that are reading it. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned making breastfeeding, you know, a little bit less uh, daunting and more accessible. And I think that one of the big components when it comes to breastfeeding, obviously there's so much around getting the latch and milk supply and all that established in the beginning. But I also think that pumping is really overwhelming. It's this crazy contraption that you've never right. used before. You feel like you're, you know, being hooked up to like a dairy cow machine. <laughs> so what are some of the things you really like moms to know about pumping before they, you know, if they've never used one before? So I think being more, um, acquainted with your pump is important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's if, if you can get one while you're still pregnant and, and you don't have the burden of trying to figure out motherhood, you know, a new baby mm -hmm. is very overwhelming, even if it's your second or third or fourth. Um, you know, if you got a new pump, take it out of the box, play around with it, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but something I really want to stress is, if you don't have a pressing need to pump, you don't have to pump right away. Right. Um, and I think I think having a pump or been, being given a pump um, while you're still in the hospital setting, perhaps, um, whatever the, the case may be, um, it, it's kind of like, well, it's there. Maybe I'm supposed to be using it. Mm -hmm. um, and then those questions of, well, how often and how long and should it? Should it fit a certain way? Should I use a certain strength? It just opens up a can of worms of all these questions. So, um I think first and foremost is be familiar with your pump if you have to use it and then figure out if you even need to use it in that time and, and not be afraid to ask questions when it is time to bring out the pump. There are people like myself who are at the ready to answer those kinds of questions and it's, it is so okay to ask. It's not a stupid question to ask about when and how and how often and all those sorts of things. It's very important to ask. Yeah, definitely. And I think that what you said about getting familiar with it even before baby is born is great just because there's so many pieces and you might actually take the time to read the directions and get all the parts put together properly versus you know, sleep deprived postpartum and right. getting things in the wrong place. But I know for me, I didn't really, you know, truly pump until I went back to work. So, um, do you have any suggestions for people that are planning to be, you know, spending time away from their baby and needing to pump for that reason as far as like introducing the pump, like how much should you, you know, have stored and when should you start using it and that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty anxiety inducing kind of thought process for many moms if they're not sure how to go about that. So if you know when you're going to be returning to work or know when you're going to be separated, uh, maybe you're traveling and not bringing baby with you for whatever reason, um, I, I think it's good to kind of have a plan of action, mm -hmm. but not let it overwhelm you. Um, I think we're all guilty of going on Pinterest or Googling and seeing um, freezers that are just packed full of stored milk and thinking, that's that's the the gauge. That's the rule of thumb of what you have to have in order to be away from your baby and be successful with pumping. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case. Um, so I think if you have a good week, two weeks ahead of when you are going to be away, that's great time to start storing. 
um, or to start beginning to, to that pumping process. Um, you don't have to do it from day one. You know, as soon as you have baby, if, if you're going back to work three and four months down the road, you know, start a week or two before you have to go. Depending on how well you respond to a pump, you might get away with only having to pump once or twice a day. And is it better to pump after baby eats or? That's a very common question. Um, I I think the best time is number one, first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then if baby's still asleep, go ahead and pump. Mm-hmm. Is, is, is been my example, but everybody's different. So, um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is a lactating breast is never truly empty. Mm-hmm. And so emptied breasts as in expressed breasts make more milk faster. Right. Supply and demand. So, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you don't have to feel super full to know that you still have milk. Um, and so a pump is not going to completely drain you. Mm-hmm. And if baby acts hungry and you've already pumped, you can still put baby to breast and offer to, to, to nurse. Baby's going to get things out that the pump can't. And you're already replenishing what you've pumped out, too. So you've got that going for you, too. So mm-hmm. um, trying to just take a deep breath and not overthink that part of it of, of the before after baby is fed, I think is very important too. You know, it's just keep in mind, you've got more there than what you were able to pump out. And something else to keep in mind too is, you know, you, you may be pumping for storage purposes, but you're, you're going to need to want to, you're going to need to pump even while you're away. So mm-hmm. that's going to be going to your, to your stash as well. Um, and that's for health purposes too. You can't be going, you know, four more hours without pumping or expressing. So, you know, keep in mind too, that that's going to be, um, adding to your stash. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, um, as far as amounts needed, um, a baby that's under six months of age, uh, averages about, um, an ounce for every hour of the day. And now they may they may go two and three hours in between feeds, so that means they take in two to three ounces of feeding. Mm-hmm. So you can use that calculation to figure out how many how many ounces you need. If you're if you're away for um, an eight hour work day and it takes you thirty minutes to go to work and thirty minutes to get back, that's nine hours away from baby. So you need approximately nine to ten ounces of milk. It's not a lot when you break it down like that. It can kind of take the pressure off mom too to to have all of that prepared. Yeah, definitely. And I think that your point about pumping in the morning is so good because it can get really discouraging if you're not pumping as much in the evening. And so seeing those full bottles in the morning is good motivation, I think, to keep pumping. That's a great point. It's, it kind of sets the day off mm-hmm. to a very productive start. Yeah. So what have you seen with the Motif Luna? I've used this pump and I've used a lot of breast pumps over my three kids. And this has been by far my favorite. I just feel like it's super efficient. It's a million times quieter than some of the other ones I've used. And I find the flanges are really comfortable. But you've talked to a lot of moms that have used it. So what are you hearing about it and noticing yourself? Well, honestly, I'm hearing a lot of the same thing. Um, yeah. Moms are loving how quiet it is. I know that it's it's, it's um, kind of distracting enough when you're, you're trying not to think about the fact that you're pumping. You're trying to relax. You're trying to, you know, maybe change your mindset on what's going on mm-hmm. so that you can have a better output. A quiet engine really helps that. And, and the fact that it's still strong enough um, to double pump. And what I mean by that, if, if listeners aren't familiar with that term, um, this engine can keep up strength-wise, um, having both hoses hooked up. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we typically think of uh, strength power, um, and it's it it makes sense that once that that strength has been divided into two tubes versus it all going into one tube, mm-hmm. if you're just pumping one side or the other, that it might lower a little bit. Mm-hmm. But what I've seen is it it doesn't affect whether you pump one side at a time or both sides at a time. Um, and so moms are spending less time pumping Mm -hmm. and they're getting, they're getting milk out with this pump that they're not necessarily getting out with other, other pumps that they may have tried if they've had that opportunity to compare. Um, so I think that's pretty remarkable to point out is this engine keeps up no matter if you're single or double pumping. Yeah. I've noticed that I, I can finish in about 10 minutes versus maybe 20 with other pumps. And by 20 minutes, my nipples are pretty uncomfortable. So I'm grateful for that faster pumping time for sure. 
Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I hear that a lot. 10, 15 minutes, most moms are done. And mm-hmm. I mean, I don't even notice. Average. Like I realize, oh, nothing's <laughs> coming out anymore because I've been like, you know, checking emails or something. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I should turn this thing off. <laughs> so it's like a really efficient baby, which is really hard to mimic. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, any tips for, I mentioned that the flanges are really comfortable for me on the motif. I don't know if I just mm-hmm. lucked out, you know, trying the best fit, but, um, any tips for that? If people are feeling like maybe they don't have a good fit, what should they be looking for? Yeah. Um, so I teach the, the, I love you sign with your hands, you know, the thumb, the index finger and the pinky mm-hmm. and the pinky being the, the smaller size, it's usually around a 21 millimeter. If your nipple is larger than that, and you think you might need to go a size up, you're feeling any pinching feelings or rubbing, that sort of thing, uh, go go a size up. You know, try a 24 millimeter or something like that. Um, the 27 is, is indicative of like the thumb size. So mm-hmm. we think 27 for the thumb, 24 for the index finger, and 21 for the pinky. And so use that to, to measure the diameter of your nipple. And if you see a bunch of rubbing going on on the narrower part of the flange, it's mm-hmm. time to, to move up a size. Um, or even down down a size, if you're getting too much breast tissue, if, if it's clamping on the areola, you're actually kinking that hose, if you will, mm-hmm. um, if too much tissue is being gathered in there, or if there's a lot of rubbing going on. So playing around with different sizes if you need to, um, maybe even use a lubricant. I know some people use like a nipple balm or mm-hmm. coconut oil or something like that. Um, and putting and it actually on the flange, not just your nipples is something exactly. I learned, which I did not know with my first <laughs> pumping experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that tip as well because it that that is a great a great little um word of advice. Some moms are just a little bit more sensitive or maybe they're kind of in between sizes, maybe they've got some fluctuations going on, maybe baby's been cluster feeding. There's different reasons why you might be experiencing um just a little bit more discomfort in times and not in others. So, you know, that's a great tool to have in your toolbox to mm-hmm. to make things a little bit more comfortable. Um Something else you can think about, too, is measuring each individual nipple. I've had plenty of moms that have to use two different sizes. So, oh, you yeah, know, good point. <laughs> they're, they're sisters. They're not twins. So, you know, yeah. make sure that you have the right size for each nipple. Um, yeah, there's, there's, you're, you're an individual. Always remember that. Yeah, I've, I think that that really goes to uh, the whole thing where people always talk about one side produces more milk, too. Yeah. It's just so interesting. And mine's been that way with three kids. It's always been the right <laughs> side is my big producer. So. The super boob. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sisters, not twins. And what's interesting, too, just a little side note there is with every pregnancy, the um, alveoli, the organs that actually store your milk, mm-hmm. um, get bigger and more numerous with each pregnancy. Oh. So. That it, it it could probably stand to say that we lactate a little bit easier with each pregnancy. Yeah, and it comes in faster, at least for me. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much for sharing all this great um, advice with us. And then if you want to send any of your favorite um, articles you've written, I would love to link to those on the show notes page as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some great ones coming out. We're covering uh, the, the battery uh, powered Luna, um, and all of the great uh, versatility and conveniences that that offers without sacrificing, you know, strength and, and all of that good stuff. So, um, be on the lookout and I will, um, I'll send those links over to you. Yeah. I'm so excited for the battery powered version. Cause that's it's like the one thing that, uh, motif didn't have, they have the smaller handheld battery one, but getting this, mm-hmm. like you said, the full powered Luna with the battery right. operated right. option is really yeah. nice. It looks exactly Larger the volume. same. So we were talking yeah. about it before we started recording that there's not really any differences other than it's more convenient. So that's exactly. great. Exactly. Toted around with you and, and if you've got other kiddos and you need to follow them around from room to room, you don't have to unplug or, you know, anything like that. There's just so many possibilities with this new option. I love that Motif has once again given us another option for our moms. Yeah, and the Luna's already, like, smaller and more lightweight than a lot of pumps. So I think having right. a battery-operated version just makes sense, too, because it's so portable right. already. It's perfect sense. Perfect sense. All right. Well, thank you so much again <laughs> for chatting with me today, Ashley. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again to Amanda for sharing her stories with us and to Motif Medical for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Amanda's name in the search bar. And if you want to check out the Luna Breast Pump and other products from Motif Medical, head over to motifmedical.com slash birthhour. 
Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.